My name is Stuart Green, and I'm a principal in Davies Colson Caves Trademarks Group. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the latest installment of Davies Colson Caves webinar series, appropriately entitled Current Intellectual Property Issues for Businesses in an Online Environment. True to form, we've assembled a star-studded lineup of IP experts, and before we kick things off, as is DCC tradition, I recognize the Kemeragel people of the Aura Nation being the traditional owners of the land upon which I'm presenting and acknowledge them and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. To provide you with a roadmap of the topics we'll cover in today's webinar, after I talk to you briefly in relation to protecting trademarks in an online environment, I'll hand over to my colleague, Miriam Zanka, who will consider some of the strategies involved in pursuing counterfeit products in an online environment. Miriam will then pass to Courtney White and Suzette Pullinger, who will speak to terms of use of streaming service platforms. Privacy guru Gordon Hughes will cover privacy obligations of video teleconference providers before Fiona Galbraith will provide insight to online licensing through a, an exploration of case studies. Lachlan Sadler will then turn to the perennial topic of testimonials on business websites before lastly, but certainly not least, Nick Ramshand will bring us home with patents in an online environment. If you have any queries that you'd like to pose to our team, please submit questions via the chat or Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and our presenters will endeavor to answer these at the end of the presentation or respond to you in a timely manner offline. With formalities out of the way, we turn to protecting trademarks in an online environment. While this topic could quite easily eat up the entire hour, in the allotted time, I'm going to touch on a few essential issues and leave you with some critical points to consider. I'll start with some definitions. When we're talking about trademarks, what are we talking about? Why is it worth protecting trademarks? And why is an online environment a distinct proposition when it comes to brand protection? I'll then touch on why it is essential to invest in protecting your intellectual property, a critical aspect of which is designing, implementing, and regularly adapting a brand protection strategy. Finally, I'll weave in why it is critical to engage early and work in concert with your IP advisors to protect your trademarks. Okay, so what is a trademark? A trademark is a sign used in the course of trade that is used to distinguish the goods and services of one trader from those of another. A trademark is a territorial market identifier, a badge of origin. It conveys information about not only the source of particular goods or services, but can equally speak to an assurance as to quality, impart ideas, concepts, and aspirations designed to inform and resonate with a target market or consumer. Examples of trademarks are incorporated in the slide you're viewing now. And as you can see, these signs can include words, logos, acronyms, letters, numerals, shapes, colors, sounds, and smells. Why is an online environment a distinct proposition? When we're talking about the online environment, we could be talking about the internet generally, search engine optimization, domains, cyber squatting, unsolicited emails, phishing, providing goods or services via your own website, via online retail platforms, or through streaming platforms. Basically, anything that isn't bricks and mortar. The one constant to bear in mind when thinking about an online environment is that it is always changing, shifting, and morphing. Why are trademarks critical? Beyond being a business asset, a registered trademark provides its owner with a legal right and monopoly to the use of a sign in relation to specific goods or services. In short, a registered trademark is a statutory insurance policy for your business and brand. In terms of engaging in the online environment, a registered trademark can be and often is all important. It is the wristband to the concert. It gives you a ticket to play. Without a registered trademark, it can be extraordinarily frustrating, difficult, slow, and costly to take decisive action against unauthorized third parties that might seek to disrupt, leverage, or otherwise pass themselves off as your business or misuse your brand. For instance, when engaging with most online platforms, aside from your contact details, one of the first questions that is asked is, do you own a trademark in relation to the goods you're seeking to query? Why is this important? We're not talking about small potatoes. My colleague Miriam Zanker will speak to quantum of the issue we're talking about. But even before the COVID-19 pandemic, online trade was expanding at an exponential rate. Businesses that previously only used their websites as electronic business cards are more than ever pivoting online to take advantage of all available avenues to provide goods and services to consumers. In doing so, they are in many ways unwittingly exposing their brands 
to the risk of unauthorized duplication or imitation. It has never been easier to copy and paste and hijack a brand. Trade in fake goods creates profits for organized crime gangs at the expense of brand owners and can result not only in substandard goods, but can also risk consumer health and safety, <clears throat> directly impacting the value and trust in a business and its brand. Protecting your intellectual property. Given the online environment is in a constant state of change, investing in and taking advantage of all available means and methods of restraining or deterring infringing behavior means from a brand protection perspective that securing trademark registration of the key signs that distinguish your goods and services becomes critical. By doing so, the idea is to place your business and brand in the best possible position to be able to take cost-effective and decisive action against unauthorized third parties. While many businesses and brands think that once they've registered a trademark, that's the end of the story, as a matter of best practice, conducting regular health checks or audits to ensure that, you're, that you understand what you have in your arsenal of IP rights and filling any gaps is also extraordinarily important. Brand protection strategy. The design, implementation, and adherence to a holistic, multifaceted, and proactive brand protection strategy based on the three pillars of detection, prevention, and rapid response is essential for business to adapt to the challenge of an ever-changing online environment. As noted, a registered trademark gives you a ticket to play. It then comes down to how you leverage your trademark and use the available tools to detect, prevent, and respond. This is typically something that is best considered in concert with your intellectual property advisors. So pillar one, detection. Detection can involve instituting watches of your key brands and trademarks, those of your competitors, establishing automated notification services, media and social media monitoring systems, as well as adopting surveillance tools to monitor trademark use via legitimate trade routes. The idea is to gather intelligence and capture evidence, understand what is happening in the marketplace and how consumers are interacting and perceiving a brand. This is often critical if infringement action is determined to be the most effective course. Pillar two, prevention. Prevention can encompass everything from educating consumers to know your business's brand's source of truth, using channels such as social media as a tool, not just to promote, but to educate, encouraging engagement when consumers think something's not quite right, to the more obvious active engagement with online gatekeepers. For instance, the platforms such as eBay, Amazon, or Taobao. The third pillar, rapid response. Depending on the circumstances of the specific case, available evidence, the target consumers, the location of the infringing conduct, there are often a range of options available to restrain third party misuse of a trademark. This could be as simple as having your IP lawyer on speed dial, but more often than not, it involves training your business what to look out for and wargaming different scenarios. Time is often of the essence and having a rapid response plan in place and acting promptly can send a signal to consumers, the broader market and would be infringers that a trademark is actively defended. Equally, sitting on one's hands and allowing infringers to take advantage of and misuse a brand can often, have a serious, can often have a serious and detrimental effect on the value of a business. So I'm going to leave you with three takeaways. Firstly, invest in the protection of your IP. From a brand protection trademark perspective, but equally across all types of intellectual property, it is critical to secure, maintain, and manage the rights that enable you to have a range of options to avail yourself of and take effective action. Secondly, work with your IP advisors to design, implement, and adhere to brand protection strategies. As intellectual property specialists, we have extensive experience in assisting businesses and brand, own brand owners from a wide variety of industries. You can have an amazing plan, but unless you stick to it, there's very little value in it. Finally then, it's important to learn the lessons and then feed one's experience back into your strategy. Noting my time, I'll hand you over to my colleague Miriam Zanka to consider some of the strategies involved in pursuing counterfeit products in an online environment. Hi everyone, my name is Miriam Zanka and I'm a principal lawyer in Davies Collison Cave Law's IP litigation team. Following on from Stuart's presentation, I'm going to spend a few minutes discussing some of the methods currently available for identifying and preventing online counterfeiting. 
The estimated losses caused by counterfeiting activities each year are nothing less than eye-watering. In 2019, it was estimated by the OECD that counterfeits represented approximately 3.3% of global trade, or more than 500 billion US dollars. Aside from lost sales and price gouging, counterfeits can present serious health and safety problems for consumers, as well as cause significant damage to a brand's reputation. Not only that, but online counterfeiting is still on the rise, assisted by the advent of more sophisticated and user-friendly online marketplaces and payment platforms, including Amazon and eBay, social media marketplaces on Facebook and Instagram, and other traders such as Redbubble. This has provided counterfeiters with the ability to reach a far wider audience in terms of geographic territory and number of marketplaces than might have previously been possible. The recent shutdowns due to the COVID-19 pandemic have also driven more sales online than ever before. So what can be done to stop counterfeits? Well, first, there are your traditional trademark or copyright enforcement methods, which involve sending a letter of demand requesting that the counterfeits be removed from sale and delivered up for destruction, and requesting that undertakings are given that they won't do it again. And these undertakings are usually requested within seven days. The difficulty, however, is that traditional enforcement methods are not always well suited for an online environment. For example, sometimes it's not possible to find out who is operating an eBay store or website. Sometimes the seller is located outside Australia, which can make it difficult to sue or enforce orders from an Australian court against the seller. Counterfeit goods are often sold in small batches and are fast moving items. Therefore, a seven day turnaround time and a letter of demand could be too late. By the time the deadline is up, the goods are already sold out and the seller has disappeared. And finally, even if you are able to identify the seller and take court action against them in Australia, the costs and time involved to do so can be prohibitive. If you're dealing with small quantities of items, that only retail at a few dollars each, it can be difficult to justify the thousands of dollars required to commence a simple infringement proceeding in the federal court or the federal circuit court. And of course, there's no guarantee that an infringer will obey a court order, let alone comply with an order to pay your legal costs. And against this, it needs to be borne in mind that the platform provider usually has the ability to immediately shut down the sale of counterfeit items either by closing down the seller's account or by taking down the individual listings. But traditionally, these providers have been reluctant to do so. The difficulties of applying traditional enforcement methods against online counterfeits have led in recent years to legislative reform and a series of cases around the world against the providers of online marketplaces seeking to sheet home liability to those providers if they ignore requests to take down listings for counterfeit items. As a result, many platform providers for online marketplaces and social media are now offering takedown notification services to assist with more cost-effective rapid identification and removal of infringing entries from online retail platforms. The benefit of these programs is that they are relatively quick and cheap. The presumptions lie typically in favour of the IP rights holder, which means that the material is taken down upon receiving a complaint, and then it is up to the seller to prove that it should be reinstated. And finally, it's done on minimal information. You just need to identify your IP rights and the infringing item number or URL. Now on this slide, we've set out a summary of some of the takedown notification programs that are currently available across different platforms and the types of intellectual property rights that they cover. eBay is, as you can see from this slide, one of the broader programs and is possibly one of the um, longer lasting programs. Uh, their program is called Vero, which stands for Verified Rights Owner. And once you have registered with the program, all that you need to do is provide your registered trademark or the copyright material that you're relying upon, identify the offending eBay listing number and give a reason for the complaint. And there's about 10 different reasons on the form that you can choose from. 
If the complaint is accepted, the listing is usually taken down within two to three days. And Gumtree, Etsy, Facebook, Instagram and Google all have very similar programs, although as you can see from the slide, the um, rights to which they relate do differ. Amazon has similar processes, but has also developed Project Zero, which has only recently in the past few weeks been extended to Australia. Project Zero is an automated self-service system for identifying and removing trademark infringements. It applies to registered trademarks only, and in order to access the program, the rights holder needs to first register with the Amazon Brands Registry. You'll see towards the far right of the page that I've listed Redbubble. Now Redbubble is a company who's been the subject of a number of recent copyright and trademark infringement cases in Australia. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Redbubble website, it's a website that allows artists to upload their artwork to the site and then consumers can buy it printed on items such as coffee cups, posters or t-shirts. Now, at the time the litigation was commenced against Redbubble in Australia several years ago, Redbubble had no formal takedown program available and it took the position it wasn't responsible for any infringements that might be uploaded by its customers. However, in recent years, possibly due to the litigation, it too has now introduced a process for rights holders to lodge an infringement notice identifying any trademark or copyright material that they believe to be infringing. And finally, on the far right of the slide, I've um, referred to Alibaba and their Taobao online marketplace. These are marketplaces that have um, copped a lot of criticism for the number of counterfeits that are available for sale on those websites. Despite this, Taobao does in fact have an IP protection program. But unlike many of the other programs listed on this slide, the presumption is far more in favour of the seller. So for example, a rights holder will lodge a complaint, but then the seller has an opportunity to provide a response before the complaint and response are sent to the IP enforcement team to decide whether to take the listing down. Therefore, it is a slower program and not as streamlined as some of the other programs available on other marketplaces. A few other things to note about takedown notifications. Typically, there's no charge associated with lodging a complaint. However, the rights holder may be required to indemnify the platform provider in the event that there's any loss or damage suffered because an incorrect takedown notice was lodged. Many programs will allow an authorised representative, such as a lawyer or attorney, to lodge notifications on behalf of the rights holder. There are different procedures available for each platform which means it's not possible to lodge a universal claim across several platforms. Most of these programs still require proactive conduct from the rights owner. That is, it's their responsibility to monitor the website and to notify the platform provider about any infringements. The exception to this seems to be Amazon's new Project Zero program, which introduces a greater level of automation. But this means that takedown notifications really need to be part of an ongoing monitoring and enforcement campaign by a rights holder, possibly on a weekly or monthly basis in order to be effective. And finally, it's worth keeping in mind that sometimes you will still need a letter of demand, notwithstanding that you've been able to get the items removed quickly from the online website. Um, this is often the case if there's other infringing conduct occurring outside the platform, and if you think there would be a benefit to being able to obtain enforceable undertakings from the infringer. Additionally, there are some issues associated with the programs. As I've mentioned, they don't cover all intellectual property rights and often unregistered trademark rights are not covered. The programs do not involve the issuing of any court orders or injunctions. Therefore, there is nothing to stop a seller from relisting their items on the website or elsewhere. Although some providers do have a repeat offender policy, which allows them to shut down a store in the event of repeat infringements. Now, given that many of these programs and websites are global, there can sometimes be some issues and time delays whilst you identify the correct grounds for removal in your complaint. And often these are caused by differences in terminology between jurisdictions eBay has now addressed this problem by introducing jurisdiction-specific complaint forms, 
which seems to have ironed out some of these issues. And finally, it's worth noting that some providers share copies of complaints with both the infringer and with other third parties, such as the Lumen database. This is the website formerly known as chillingeffects.org. And it's a website which names and shames those companies that they believe are filing unmeritorious takedown notices. However, when used in the right situation, takedown notices can be effective at quickly removing counterfeit items from sale. Finally, I'll just touch on another recent innovation aimed at reducing sales of counterfeits, which is the Australian Government's new Trust Badge program. The program is still at an early stage, but IP Australia recently announced a collaboration with the NRL to trial the program on its online merchandise stores. The program involves the trader applying for a smart trademark, which is applied as a clickable badge to the seller's website. And you can see an example of that in the top right hand corner of the slide and I've circled the smart trademark. If you click on that badge, it links, it provides you with a screen that looks very similar to the um, one at the bottom of the screen. And that links to the Australian Trademark Register and provides you with the registr registration details for the trademark and verifies that you're dealing with an authorised seller. Now, if the trial is successful, it is hoped that it will soon be rolled out to other industries that are also often the targets of counterfeiting activities. So other sport, sports merchandise, luxury fashion goods, and possibly even wine in an effort to try to stamp out counterfeits. So the take home messages are, first of all, online counterfeits are a growing area and can be costly to manage, but they shouldn't be ignored because of the damage that they can do to your business. Increasingly, platform providers are making it easier and more cost effective to have counterfeits removed from online marketplaces through takedown programs. New innovations such as IP Australia's new smart trademark program aim to assist customers in ensuring they are buying genuine merchandise. And finally, it is important to be proactive, to monitor the marketplace for counterfeits and to educate consumers about the importance of checking that they are buying genuine goods. And now I'll hand over to Suzette and Courtney. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Courtney White and I'm a lawyer in Davies Collison Caves Law Group. And I'm Suzette Pullinger, a trademarks attorney in our trademarks group. Today we'll be presenting on the terms of use of streaming service platforms. While delivering content to audiences via streaming service platforms is not a new concept, this year we've seen many forms of events, meetings and gatherings shift predominantly to online streaming service platforms. And moving these business activities on, in an online environment, um, including in the context of music performances, can create greater complexity in terms of protecting and licensing IP rights, uh, for example, in the context of performance. Courtney will first talk us through the current terms of use of several streaming service platforms to highlight what can lawfully be done um, with user content. I'll then turn briefly to some infringement reporting mechanisms on these platforms and also how you can use your trademarks in online environments to pre preserve your position and reputation and prevent vulnerability for non-use. So when you use a streaming service platform, the terms of use generally provide that you grant a license to others to use the content that you upload. The nature of the license in terms of who it is granted to, what the licensee can do with the content and the duration of the license differs between each platform. I've set out a table that summarizes the nature of the licenses for some commonly used platforms. It's good to know that when you upload content onto these platforms, you retain ownership of your intellectual property in the content whether that be the copyright in the lyrics of a song or the trademark of a band name. However, the license you grant allows others to use your content in certain ways. On Facebook and Twitch, the license is only granted to the platform itself, whereas YouTube's terms of use takes a step further and provides that the license you grant to the platform also extends to YouTube users, so they can lawfully use your content um, as enabled by the functions of the platform, but not on another platform independent of YouTube. Uh, the terms of use of SoundCloud and TikTok go even further and provide the licenses granted to third parties as well. For TikTok, this covers third party platforms that don't even exist yet. Uh, the scope of the licenses for each platform 
uh, tend to have some overlap with each license having in common they are non-exclusive, royalty-free and worldwide. While this means you can continue to use your intellectual property and grant further licenses, the licensees can use your content without any geographic restrictions and without paying you any money for using your content. TikTok would have to be the broadest license of the platforms, uh, particularly given that the license is perpetual and um, it sets out that TikTok can use your content as it sees fit and also use your name, image, voice and the likeness for commercial purposes, such as an external ad campaign. Uh, the other platforms generally provide that the license ends once the user content or account is deleted or shortly after. I would like to note that this table is reflective of the current terms of use, but these terms of use can be subject to change. So what if you think someone has infringed your IP um, in the context of these platforms? So you may recall uh, that Miriam touched base on several infringement reporting mechanisms in respect of Instagram and Facebook, for example, in the context of online counterfeiting. Now, as she mentioned, there's several different procedures for each platform, so you can't just lodge one universal claim. So, for example, YouTube, uh, they can issue copyright takedown notices. Twitch, you need a written notification to their designated copyright agent. SoundCloud also has similar online reporting mechanisms. Facebook's, you can report violations of copyright or trademark rights. Um, there is provision there to enter in the details of your registered trademarks, for example. TikTok online forms are there also to report copyright and trademark infringement. Uh, and Zoom, you, there's also a copyright notice um, you can do by email. Now, it's important to note that these uh, platforms don't have third party adjud adjudication uh, mechanisms ne necessarily. So if there is a dispute, um, as Miriam mentioned earlier, a coordinated approach with a letter of demand is often appropriate. So if in doubt, uh, have a chat to your lawyer or attorney about how these mechanisms may be able to be used in conjunction. Uh, so. So performing a cover version of someone else's song, for example, can create a range of rights under copyright law, um, but as well as using someone's photo or other IP, such as trademarks on social media, it's important to ensure that permission is sought from these IP rights owners uh, before, they're, before they're used. Otherwise, you might find yourself at the end of one of these takedown notifications that I was mentioning in the earlier slide. And it's also important to note that many of these platforms, which Courtney mentioned as well, uh, is that the user of, often is required to warrant that the content they upload does not infringe on those third party rights. So it's very important to um, have an understanding of that before you upload them. Um, so just in the context of music, for example, if I was to upload an original composition, uh, I wouldn't get any warning or anything like that if I was to upload that to Facebook. Uh, but if I was to play a cover song, it might recognise some of that music and I might get a warning or even be prevented, prevented initially from uploading that. So even in that context, it's very important to get permission from the get go. Um, in the context of trademarks, as Stuart flagged earlier, brand protection strategy is important, such as detection, prevention um, and rapid response if things are occurring online. Uh, but also how you're using your trademark in the online environment is very important to prevent, to protect your reputation, but also to prevent risks such as vulnerability for non-use of a registered trademark. So things you might consider doing uh, overlaying your trademark on YouTube videos. So bands often do this, for example, they might overlay uh, their band name on there. It would direct people to their YouTube site. Similarly, um, you might like to do this for your business if you're advertising. Uh, maintaining use of a trademark on a website and other social media platforms, but also displaying active measures to so show your trademark use. So if you're using um, things in a different way online than you may have traditionally in the past, keep um, your customers updated about what you're doing now um, with your brand and your projected plans in the future can also be helpful in this respect. So to conclude, um, we've set out three key points, uh, being that it is important to be aware of one, the terms of use for each platform. So a user understands their obligations and understands what use um, by third parties falls within the scope of the license. 
Uh, secondly, uh, the tools and recourse available to report any conduct that is potentially infringing on intellectual property rights. And finally, um, it's important to be aware of various intellectual property rights, whether they be your own or um, the intellectual property rights of third parties. Hi, um, my name is Gordon Hughes. I'm going to uh, be talking about uh, certain privacy obligations that have become important in the context of um, video teleconference recording. Uh, the issue has uh, arisen because of the exponential growth in uh, video conferencing uh, during the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic lockdowns. Um, and with this exponential growth has come uh, a few legal issues relevant to uh, this increased activity, uh, mainly surrounding the fact that there's a huge increase in the volume of data, including personal information, which is now being transmitted and transmitted in ways that it hasn't been transmitted before. The issue has recently been highlighted in a letter sent by the Australian Information Commissioner, who is also the Privacy Commissioner, uh, to VTC service providers uh, on the 22nd of July of this year. Um, now, the reason I'm discussing it today is that it actually has broader implications than just um, the activities of the VTC service providers themselves. The message contained in the letter and the concerns expressed by the Privacy Commissioner in the letter are equally relevant in most respects to uh, any business, any organisation which is util uh, utilising uh, teleconferencing now to communicate as a matter of course with its employees or with its clients or customers. Now this letter that I'm referring to uh, wasn't the sole initiative of the Australian Information Commissioner, it was in fact part of a, uh, uh, a global initiative uh, co-signed with five other uh, data protection uh, regulation authorities um, from around the world, from Canada, Gibraltar, uh, Hong Kong, Switzerland, uh, and the United Kingdom. Uh, it was sent to uh, VTC providers at large, but it was separately and specifically sent to the five largest providers of VTC services around the world, namely Microsoft, Cisco, Zoom, House Party, and Google. And the express purpose that's set out in the opening paragraph of the letter is that the privacy uh, regulators sought to articulate their privacy expectations of VTC providers and reminding them about risk mitigation strategies which they should be uh, adopting. As I say, the letter was addressed and targeted to VTC service providers, but the messages you'll find are equally relevant to any business utilising VTC technology. Now the letter set out five principles. It set out its recommendations and its reminders under five separate heads. Those heads related to security, uh, privacy by design, uh, a heading called Know Your Audience, uh, transparency and end user control. And I'm just going to quickly run through the key messages that come through under each of those five headings. In relation to security, the letter uh, highlighted the numerous reports that we've all read regarding uh, security flaws in this type of technology or the potential for breaches of security. Uh, and the letter admonished uh, service providers to uh, take steps to build into their system protective measures uh, to minimise the risk of unauthorised access um, to the service. They recommended uh, the implementation of security measures such as encryption, 
know, two-factor uh, authentica authentication and strong passwords. And it further emphasised the particular importance of these measures where so-called sensitive information is concerned. And that's important, of course, because of the rise in the usage of this sort of uh, method of communication um, with um, telehealth and with education, um, both of which can uh, obviously involve the transmission of a significant amount of sensitive information. Uh, so that's a security message that's been sent to service providers, but the message should be equally clear to any company that is adopting that technology as a means of communication. Uh, the second principle uh, was under the heading privacy by design. When privacy regulators use the expression privacy by design, they're talking about the need for any organisation to build into its systems, into its workplace systems, um, a process for ensuring that privacy considerations uh, are, are, are remain paramount. Uh, in this context, they talked about uh, the importance of privacy conscious default uh, settings, um, ensuring that effective consent is obtained from users, uh, and generally minimising the amount of personal information that's capable of being captured or which is captured by default uh, when the system is used. Um, they also recommended that service providers each undertake a privacy impact assessment and again this is equally relevant to organisations utilising this sort of mechanism of communication. The privacy impact assessment uh, in in, in data protection terms means engaging an independent expert to come in and review uh, how personal information is handled and monitored and, and dealt with generally in the workplace and ensuring that it doesn't expose the organisation to any risks of privacy infringement. Uh, the next principle uh, is headed know your audience and it emphasises a truism that these platforms are being deployed in contexts that they weren't originally designed for. Some of the platforms were originally designed for use in business, some of the platforms were originally designed uh, for social interaction, but now they are routinely being used by people, uh, many of whom are inexperienced and are unfamiliar with the technology and inexperienced in use of it in the professional sense and this creates problems of its own. Uh, as the letter said it has the potential to create unanticipated privacy risks and so uh, the letter admonished VTC service providers to monitor their platform, their environment for privacy weaknesses particularly where vulnerable or inexperienced or unsophisticated uh, users were concerned. That's the message to the service provider. The message is equally relevant to uh, organisations utilising this form of communication technology. The um, letter further emphasised the importance of transparency. Transparency is a key concept in privacy law. Uh, and in doing so, it reminded uh, uh, service providers to be mindful of their basic privacy obligations, which in an Australian context um, appear in the Australian privacy principles, which are scheduled to the Privacy Act. It emphasised the need for uh, openness. That means being upfront about what personal information is going to be collected and why. That's set out in Australian Privacy Principle 1. It emphasised the need for lawfulness and fairness. And what that means is only collect personal information where it's lawful to do so, but also where it's fair to do so. No surreptitious collection of personal information which the individual might be unaware of. And be upfront about how that information will be used. This is already a requirement under Australian principle, uh, Privacy Principle 5. 
It's one thing to collect personal information, but it's a fundamental concept of data protection that the individual knows when they're consenting to the collection of their information exactly what they're proposing to do with it. An organisation can't collect personal information for one express reason and then use it for a totally uh, unrelated reason. And in that context, the uh, letter emphasised that if you're, if you're seeking consent from individuals as to how you're going to use their personal information, which you acquire as a consequence of a VTC uh, meeting, make sure that that consent is overt and upfront, not buried in the fine print of a privacy policy, uh, and make sure that the consent is specific and uninformed. And what they mean there is make sure it's not bundled up with consent to a whole lot of other things which may be uh, involve totally different uh, purposes. Finally, the, uh, uh, the principles outlined in the letter uh, emphasise the importance of end user control. And the point they were, uh, the letter seeks to make is that end users ultimately have no effective control over the choice of platform. That's a fact. A business will organise uh, a VTC meeting, it will specify the platform users generally uh, well, almost invariably have no control over the choice of platform. If they're going to participate, they're going to have to use the platform nominated by the conference organiser. Uh, and service providers are admonished to bear that in mind. Businesses setting up the conference should likewise bear it in mind. And the letter referred in that context to uh, uh, various monitoring features. In other words, it emphasised that people must be aware of how they are collecting personal information um, in these conferences. It's not just the spoken word, it's the fact that it's being recorded. So people have to know that it's being recorded. Uh, it might be being transcribed, people have to know that. And if mechanisms are activated to collect location data or other information that might be relevant to an individual or identify an individual, that has to be expressed up front as well. That's all I want to say about this topic. Uh, and I say once again, the message is directed specifically at platform providers, but the essence of the message is equally relevant to any business which is uh, seeking to use uh, utilise VTC for its meetings, which these days is most professional businesses. That's all I'm going to say for now, um, but obviously I'm going to be uh, happy to answer any questions later on. Hello, my name is Fiona Galbraith and I'm one of the IP lawyers in Davies Collis and Capes Law Group. Today I'm going to present a short case study which looks at how your content might be lawfully used by unrelated third parties on the internet. The facts of this case study are closely based on a recent federal court case, Hardingham and RP Data, but they've been simplified a little for the purpose of this case study. My first slide attempts to set the scene. The main player in this um, case study is a photographer. He's a business owner and he's the copyright owner in this case. The Photographer's job was to take photos of properties for real estate agents, and those are the properties used in the marketing campaigns to sell or lease properties. The photographer found out that an unrelated third party company was reproducing and using his photos on its website. The photographer brought court proceedings alleging that the third party website was engaging in copyright infringement. On this slide, the different coloured arrows denote the various copyright licences running between the different parties. There was never any written copyright license between the photographer and his clients, the real estate agents, who I've called the middlemen. The only paperwork issued between them were invoices, which were paid by the agents. However, the parties agreed there was an unwritten copyright license, but there was a dispute over the duration of that license, which is a key issue in this case study I'm presenting. I'll talk about that a bit more later. Moving down the slide, the, um, the light green arrow points to a real estate agent industry platform, Big Real Estate. 
Now, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the big real estate online platforms in Australia, and it's important to note that there are a few very big players in this area. Um, and that's because the photographer knew that an important part of the marketing campaign that he was producing his photos for were the ads that would subsequently appear on big real estate. The real estate agents were the ones who uploaded the photos onto the big real estate platform and they uploaded those photos pursuant to a standard license, which is shown with that light green arrow. And I'll talk about that standard license in a moment. The photos were um, unsurprisingly available on big real estate during the marketing campaign, but they also remained on the big real estate platform after the marketing campaign ended. In particular, when a property was sold, the pictures then appeared in the sold section of the big real estate platform. The company noted at the bottom of the slide is the operator of the third party website, who I've called the third party data. Third party data operates a property data website which contains information available to its subscribers about the historical sale prices or rental prices of properties. Third party data's site also contains photos of those properties. And those photos, including the photographer's photos, were provided to third party data by Big Real Estate. Again, pursuant to a license, and that's the license shown with that yellow arrow. As I mentioned, the photographer didn't want third party data using his photos, and he asserted that third party data didn't have a valid license to publish his photos and was engaging in copyright infringement by doing so. My next slide looks at Big Real Estate's standard terms. Big Real Estate said that it was free to give third party data the photos because the content uploaded onto its site by the agents was subject to a standard real estate agent user license. And under that standard license, the agents granted Big Real Estate an irrevocable license to use and sub license to others that uploaded content for any purpose related to Big Real Estate's business. The agents had to agree to those terms before uploading content and they also agreed that the content uploaded would not infringe the IP rights of any third party. Big Real Estate standard terms were published and they were freely available. Importantly, the court in the Hardingham case found that it wasn't realistic in a practical sense for the agents to negotiate out of Big Real Estate standard terms. As I mentioned, there was a dispute about the duration of that unwritten copyright license between the photographer and the agents. And the resolution of that dispute essentially determines whether Big Real Estate's standard user license was effective. The photographer asserted that those licenses, the copyright licenses, ended entirely when the marketing campaign for each property ended, that is when the property was sold or rented out. And that's important because I'll just jump back to the first slide, having a look at that bottom yellow arrow first, Big Real Estate can't give third party data a valid license to use the photos after the marketing campaign has ended if, going up one step to that light green arrow, the real estate agents didn't have the right to give Big Real Estate a license to use and sub license the photos after the marketing campaign ended. So the photographer's argument was that the license he gave the middlemen, so that's that dark green arrow, was actually narrower than the standard license the agents purported to give to big real estate. So going back, third party data's argument was that it was inferred or alternatively implied that the license the photographer gave the agents was a broader license to use the photos. And they said that it included publication of the photos for historical information and research purposes after the marketing campaign ended. So third party data said that the license gave the real estate agents the right to grant sub licenses of that scope to big real estate. The court in the Hardingham and RP data case accepted third party data's arguments. The court found that a key reason the agents engaged the photographer was to publish the photos on the big real estate platform and to do so on big real estate standard terms. The photographer knew that and he dealt with the agents having that knowledge. It was what was objectively intended by the arrangement between the photographer and the agents. Given these circumstances, it was to be inferred or alternatively implied 
that the photographer had granted the agents a license which allowed them to authorise big real estate to use and to sub-license his photos on big real estate standard terms, including after the marketing campaign ended. So it follows from that, for the reasons I discussed, the real estate agents had sufficient rights in the photos to enter into big real estate standard terms. And the consequence of that was that the photographer couldn't subsequently restrict third party data's publication of his photos. This case study, I think, illustrates the importance of documenting rights to content. For example, when content is created by a business commissioning another to create that content. And part of the photographer's problems in this case study stemmed from the fact that he didn't have a written agreement with the real estate agents. It's also important to understand the standard terms and conditions of online platforms using your business's content. And that's already been noted earlier in this webinar. That's the end of my presentation today. Thank you very much for listening. Hi everyone, my name is Lachlan from DCCL's Melbourne office and I'm going to be speaking briefly here about a recent decision of the Federal Court in the ACCC and service seeking that involved online consumer reviews. Um, so the facts here are basically that service seeking uh, was kind of a, or is an Uber style platform where tradespeople and businesses can offer their services to consumers who need work done along the lines of end of lease cleaning or plumbing work. Uh, the controversial element of the system here was service seeking's fast feedback system, uh, which was operative for around three years up until mid 2019. And this system enabled um, businesses after they'd finished a review for uh, after they'd finished a job for a consumer, instead of the consumer reviewing the business's job on the platform, the business was able to review their own job that they'd performed for the consumer. And this review was then sent to, to customers via email who could either accept or nominate to write their own review. And if the customer didn't respond to this email um, in a certain amount of time, the the review that was generated based on the business's feedback of their own job would be published on their profile on Service Seeking's platform. Um, so the HLC was not a big fan of this and um, commenced proceedings against Service Seeking after some correspondence between them uh, regarding this fast feedback system. Um, by the time the case came before the federal court recently, um, service seeking had admitted liability, um, had admitted that what they'd done with the fast feedback system was misleading and deceptive in contravention of the Australian Consumer Law and uh, made joint submissions with the ACCC regarding appropriate penalties for that. Uh, nevertheless, the judge uh, had to satisfy um, himself that it was appropriate to make these penalties. So there is some brief consideration in the judgment about whether the fast feedback system is misleading and deceptive. And if we jump here, we can see these are the, the three basic forms of the fast feedback review system generated reviews. Uh, the first one there is the one that uh, service seeking used initially. Um, and then after correspondence with HLC, they changed to the second one, subsequently the third one, and then got rid of the system altogether. Um, and the judge was prepared to find that each of these forms um, of the review constituted misleading or deceptive conduct. Um, and I've circled the kind of relevant parts of each review form here. And we can see with number one, it's clearly problematic in that it's expressed in the first person, um, expressing views that the person who's purportedly making this review may have never held. And therefore, um, the judge was very prepared to find that this was misleading and deceptive. Uh, service seeking then changed to the second review you see listed here. Um, and even though that isn't expressed in the first person and purports to be the business's report of the consumer's views. Um, His Honour was still uh, prepared to find that this was misleading or deceptive because the customer may have never held those views in the first place and the business might not even suspect that they hold those views. Um, so those two were, were relatively clear cut, I think. The third one we get to here, I think service seeking was arguably a little hard done by because we can see that the form of the review is very clear that this is the business's report of the job rather than any views held by the, the consumer. Um, but his honor was nevertheless prepared to find that this was misleading and deceptive. 
uh, having regard to the fact that consumers, when scrolling through the service-seeking website and profiles on, on the, the platform, they're not going to be carefully reading reviews. They're really going to be having regard to the, the star rating of these reviews. And this review purports to leave a, a five-star rating for the business. Uh, so even if the, the text of the review um, makes it relatively clear that this is the business's own feedback, uh, the overall impression conveyed by these reviews is still misleading because it makes it seem that the business has received more favourable feedback than is actually the case. Uh, so having established that this conduct was misleading or deceptive, the next question was appropriate penalties. Uh, and the judge agreed with the party's joint submissions in this regard and ordered the penalties you see on the screen there. Uh, most importantly, the $600,000 pecuniary penalty was based on the fact that this, uh, these contraventions had been ongoing for a number of years, um, were relatively serious and that it was clearly a deliberate system done by service seeking to try to create this favorable impression of tradespeople on their platform that didn't necessarily exist. And the judge also had regard to the fact that the profits uh, made by service seeking in the 1819 financial year was around $600,000. So that's, that's exactly the, the amount of uh, penalties that were ordered here. Um, and the judge stated that this was an ex higher than an acceptable cost of doing business, meaning that it would deter other businesses from uh, implementing a similar system in the future without being crushingly large. Uh, so that was the end of that case. In terms of other relevant cases that have been run by the HLC over the last couple of years, the HLC and Meriton case involved Meriton, a service apartments provider, they had a system where they collect email addresses from people who stay in their services, service apartments and send those to TripAdvisor, who then got in touch with the, the customers and encouraged them to leave reviews on TripAdvisor. Uh, the issue was that Meriton, if they suspected that a customer was likely to leave a negative review, for example, if they'd made a complaint through their stay, they'd insert additional letters into their email addresses that they provided to TripAdvisor meaning that these customers uh, never got the email from TripAdvisor and in turn meaning that uh, there was a more favourable impression created through uh, customers who didn't have issues with their stay being exclusively contacted by TripAdvisor and the court ordered a $3 million penalty for that conduct. Um, Aveling Homes, uh, from a couple of years ago, the issue was that Aveling Homes was running a website which purported to be independent, which provided reviews of their service. Uh, when in fact they uh, controlled the content of that website and filtered out negative reviews from appearing. And Health Engine, which is an ongoing matter, um, involves a health booking platform uh, who are accused of editing customer reviews before they're put up to again make them uh, seem more positive than they actually are. And Health Engine has admitted that this is likely to be misleading or deceptive and have jointly submitted with the HLC that the court should impose nearly $3 million in penalties for that conduct. So those cases provide quite a helpful roadmap in terms of what not to do for businesses in dealing with, with online reviews. And you can see some of the points there extracted from the previous cases. Um, and most of them really boil down to not discriminating between positive and negative reviews, obviously not editing reviews, and also not discriminating between customers who you suspect are likely to leave positive reviews and customers who you suspect are likely to leave negative reviews, as we saw in the Meriton case. And that could be even things like offering incentives for positive reviews. Um, the HCCC's released guidance indicating that this may also be considered misleading and deceptive. So any uh, incentives along those lines really need to be offered indiscriminately to people who are providing online reviews regardless of the content of, of that review. Um, so that's really all I had to say, say on this issue. I'll be around afterwards to answer any questions, but otherwise we'll hand over to our next presenter. Welcome. For the next 10 minutes or so, I'll be talking to you about patents in an online environment. 10 minutes isn't very long. So I'll be focusing on one aspect of this. And that is the biggest challenge that patents face in an online environment, namely patentable subject matter. Now, I'm sure many of you are aware that to get a granted patent, you need to have novelty, inventive or innovative step, depending on whether you're going for a standard patent or an innovation patent. And you also need to have 
patentable subject matter. That is, the kind of thing you're trying to protect needs to be the kind of thing that patents are granted for. And it is that hurdle, not novelty, not inventive step, but patentable subject matter, which poses the most challenges for patents in an online environment, and therefore that's what I'll focus on today. So first, some history and background. Now, I'm no good at history. I was never good at history at school, but it is worthwhile, at least briefly, looking at what's gone before, before I look at a couple of recent cases. So I have uh, on screen, you will see four cases, and they have a number of things in common. One is they are all full federal court cases. And the second is that in each of these cases, the patent applicant or patentee failed. That is, the patents were found to be invalid or a patent application not granted on the basis that the subject matter was not the kind of subject matter for which patents should be granted. So those are the commonalities. What are some of the differences? Well, over time, the level of technical involvement, at least in the claims, has increased. So the 2006 case of Grant was really a pure business method. There was some suggestion of a computer implementation, but the claims had no technical characteristics in them. Research affiliates, uh, some eight years later, um, did have a method that was implemented by a computer. But there was, again, very little technical detail, and the method could be used or could be done without using a computer. But by the time we get to the 2019 case of Encompass, the computer implementation uh, is integral to the description and the claims. So varying levels of um, integration, if you like, with computer technology as we go through. So there's one difference. Another difference is whether the court on appeal, this is the full federal court, overturned the primary judge or not. We seem to have some consistency at full federal court level. They don't like these patents, uh, not patentable subject matter consistently for all four of these cases. But in the case of RPL Central, the primary judge found uh, that there was patentable subject matter. So at the single judge federal court level, there seems to be a little less consistency. While I'm talking about RPL Central, that an application for leave to the High Court was made in that case, and the High Court refused to hear the case on the basis that the full federal court had everything under control, there was no controversy it needed to weigh into, and the decision was clearly right. And partly, I suspect because of that, when Encompass got before the full federal court, the Chief Justice decided to allocate five judges rather than the normal three. This means that the Encompass decision is at this stage the high watermark of these cases. And where do we get to by the time we get to Encompass? Well, we get to the point where when assessing patentable subject matter, we look at two things. The first is whether the substance of the invention is a scheme or method of doing business. There is some, still some debate, despite what the High Court might think, about how one characterises the substance of the invention. But it's clear that that's the first step. Work out what the invention is, or what the substance of that is. And that consideration is not just looking at the claims, you look at the specification as a whole, including the claims. The second limb to the two-limb test is, is there anything about the invention described and claimed in the specification that suggests that it moves from unpatentable mere scheme or business method into something patentable? Does the computer the computerization add anything, add anything sufficient to take it from being unpatentable to patentable. Those are the two limbs of that test. 
So with that background, let's have a look at the uh, recent case of Rockt. Now you'll see from the diagram there that it seems quite technical. You've got a few databases, um, you've got an advertising system, a bunch of consumers on devices, looks quite technical. And this is a case where the judge at first instance found there was patentable subject matter. It was described, the invention was described in quite technical language. We had um, engagement data being analyzed um, and then an engagement offer being presented. And I'll talk a bit about this engagement offer. You're all familiar with online advertising. You see it every time you browse the web, uh, unless you have an ad blocker. But uh, one of the things that they find is that people don't interact with these ads. So what Rockt decided to do was analyze user activity um, and then upon an engagement trigger being triggered, an engagement offer would be presented. Now that engagement offer is not the advertisement, it's something else. The court described it as clickbait. Um, so it might be a free game, it might be a quiz, uh, something to entice you to click on a part of the screen. And once you've done that, then after that engagement offer has been presented, then you get the ad. So a lot of expert evidence in this case, one of the few cases where they've heard expert evidence. And the judge was quite um, convinced by the expert witness engaged by Rockt. Uh, that expert witness considered that the invention solved a technical problem. There was a difficulty in um, personalized ranking of engagement offers by integrating data from these various databases. Uh, and it changed how the computer worked, according to the expert witness, and adopted by the first instance judge because it was programmed, programmed in a particular way. It hadn't been done before. And one of the tests that has developed uh, over time is whether what the computer adds to the invention and whether that is something that is foreign to the normal use of computers. And the expert witness in this case said that it was because computers weren't normally used to do this. It had never been done before. On appeal, the court looked at a slightly different part or looked at a different level of abstraction. And you'll see based on the figure uh, on the right of the slides that um, on one aspect, it's a four-step method. And that's really where the court focused. First step of the test is to characterize the substance of the invention. So they looked at the specification to do this. They looked at the statements in the background of the specification and said, well, those are background can't be part of the invention. They looked at what the problem was, um, low levels of consumer engagement. That was the problem that was being addressed. And then the solution was said to be a four dimensional advertising model, which had various embodiments which were technically implemented. Uh, and consumers were taken on an engagement journey throughout this process. And Rockt argued that the core of its invention was that you had an engagement offer that um, interacted with these online advertising. And the online advertising, other than you, the engagement offer, was known, but it's really the incorporation of this engagement offer. And remember, Rockt was successful before the judge at first instance on this argument. The court looked at the specification and um, spent some time focusing on the fact that it wasn't very technical. They, and the way it was drafted was to say, well, you could use any kind of scoring regime. You could use any kind of measure of revenue without being specific about the specific scoring regime or measure of revenue that you should use. And the court then formed the view that the technical description was very general. Of, a very general level of abstraction. And that seemed to be influential on their decision. The court made some findings that are very interesting to look at. Firstly, that patentable subject matter is a legal question, not one for expert witnesses. So the reliance that the single judge had at first instance on expert witnesses was misplaced. When you're looking at assessing what 
subject matter is and whether something is foreign to the use of computers or not, you don't get to have reference to common general knowledge. Again, and that's evidenced by expert witness. It's really about looking at the specification. So they really highlighted the fact that you look at the face of the specification for the most part to determine what that substance is and what contribution a computer might make. They endorsed that two-step process, which I've mentioned. And uh, as I said, they looked at the level of generality in the specification and they said, well, it's really general. And that doesn't answer the question for them, but they indicated that it was a litmus test for whether the um, computer implementation added anything to the unpatentable, otherwise unpatentable scheme. If there's no technical detail, what would otherwise be a scheme or method of doing business and unpatentable wouldn't be transported or transformed into something that was patentable. The, although the specification had some technical aspects to it, those things weren't claimed and therefore weren't part of the invention. So here we had a non-technical problem, lack of consumer engagement, a non-technical solution being an advertising model or an idea of presenting click clickbait followed by an advertising offer. So at the heart of it, you had a marketing scheme. And given the level of technical generality, nothing moved that. The computer was simply a vehicle for implementing that scheme. It didn't add anything more. Uh, and briefly, I want to talk about Aristocrat, which is uh, a more recent decision by a month. And one of the judges, Justice Burley, who was on the full court for Rocked, was the judge in this case. And this was a positive case in that the, the judge found that there was patentable subject matter. Applied the same two-step test, but seemed to say that the um, previous cases, or the cases we've looked at so far, were all about the second limb of the test. Did the computer add anything? They already found that what was invented was a scheme. The question they were trying to look at was, was it trans transformed from that unpatentable scheme into something technical? And in this case, the court said, well, actually, what we have here is a special purpose machine, an electronic gaming machine. That has a specific function, and those functions change depending on what software you load in it. And therefore, you don't actually pass the first limb. So they, they tried to characterize the case as a first limb case as opposed to a second limb case. That is, this isn't a scheme or method of doing business. So you don't need to then look at whether the computer transforms it. Uh, I, I must say, I'm not confident that um, that analysis will hold up on appeal, and it is on appeal. So um, what does this all mean? The first step is working out what the invention is, and that's crucial. And if the invention is an idea or a business method, no matter how a clever patent attorney might dress it up in technical language or technical implementation, if the invention that you get when you read the specification is a non-technical invention, solves a non-technical problem, non-technical solution, ultimate implementation as described in the body of the specification won't assist you. When you're looking at what the substance of the invention is, you don't necessarily look at the prior art, you don't try to do a comparison of the contribution comparison of the invention and the prior art to work out what the contribution is, you look on the space, on the face of the specification. Having special purpose hardware helps like it did in Aristocrat, at least so far. I remember a full federal court's pretty consistent on knocking these things back at the moment. Special purpose hardware doesn't really work for an internet-based invention where you want the hardware to be as commoditized as possible. So Aristocrat is not going to help many people. Really to get an internet-based invention over the line that needs to needs to have some kind of new technology. So Amazon's one-click patent, successful, probably will be successful under today's rules, um, basically because it involved the use of cookies to store data to facilitate the checkout of uh, checking out purchasing items. So application of a new technology likely to get over the line, Google search algorithms, they improve the computer, they improve the performance of the computer, they're likely to get over the line. But if you had, uh, for example, an invention that involved um, trying to work out what tires you put on your car, knowing that you're not one of these petrol heads that 
put special tires on, you just need the standard size. You don't know what that is. You can take a photograph of your license plate. It looks up the, um, the data that uh, the registration details have in Victoria Vic Roads uh, and will tell you what kind of tire your car takes. Um, that's not likely to be patentable. Great idea. Nobody's done it before, but um, it's cobbling together uh, known technology, no new technology really being involved, even though it's put together in a new way. The core of the invention is an idea and um, it, the implementation is not going to be sufficiently technical to add, to transform that idea. So there's an example of something that won't be successful. I hope that's been useful. This area is in a state of flux, so uh, stay tuned for more updates as things develop. Thank you for your time.